the stuff that that is commercially available today doesn't lend itself to making a worthy successor to a CT5 yeah. Blackwing. There's just no doubt. Um, and that's the challenge. And that's the challenge that the team, yeah, there's a huge number of people here at GM that are actively sitting down thinking about what does a performance V um, and V Blackwing look like. There's two levels now to our product offering. And so you'll see a V and then eventually, when, when the technology is really ready, you'll see a black wing. And that, that's a little bit off in the future. I'm not going to lie. That's not next year, right? That's not even the year after. That's you finally have this, this something, almost 700 horsepower manual transmission, rear wheel drive sedan, and they're snatching it from us. <laughs> what does that mean for V going forward? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I get that question a lot. Um, v has been in the Cadillac brand for almost 20 years now. It's hard to imagine. I've been involved since the beginning. And, um, y you know, we went from what is Cadillac doing to, oh, that's interesting, you're doing it again, to waiting, you know, for us to do the third one and, and, and then what are you doing in the future, right? And so I love the fact that we get the question. And V is a part of the Cadillac brand. How brand. did it start? How did, what was the brainchild that said we need to do something like an M car? Yeah. And at that point, the the CTS had barely even come out. Yeah. Well, like I was just saying, I mean, it's it's an important part of being a relevant modern luxury brand. Everyone has a performance arm, and that was obvious to us even 20 years ago. Um, you know, obviously the whole market was less mature than it is now, and we were spot on, right? If you want to be a player and really have that rep of, of a true full line luxury manufacturer, you have to have a performance arm. And so we had a lot of discussion about what does that mean? What are we gonna stand for? What are we trying to do? You know, and from the beginning, we've just tried to make cars that we enjoyed driving and and things that we wanted to be able to take to a track day or an autocross for or whatever. For the avoidance of doubt, the audience needs to know you are a major racer. <laughs> so that's a big deal. I, I have the sickness, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. So does my son. So And um, your wife. Yeah, and my wife, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. And and really all of us, especially in the early days, um, we really went around and, and recruited. You know, we took people, like I came from the Corvette group before I came working on Cadillacs and others did as well. So we, we handpicked the right folks to do structure and, and all of it. Back then I worked on just the engine and the powertrain. Um, and over time, you know, I've, I've gotten more responsibility there. But really, we handpick the people that do the V more than we do even the rest of the car. And there's a reason for that. You, you need to know what the goal looks like. You can't explain to somebody what nonlinear handling <laughs> is supposed to be like. They have to be able to experience it and do it. And um, so they kind of gravitate towards wanting to do this. Some people don't want to have anything to do with this. So how has it evolved? Because it started with basically a Corvette engine in a, in a mid-sized sedan. Then you got into these more fancy engineered cars like the ATS-V. Yep. And then now we're at this crazy powerful CT5V Blackwing manual. Yeah, like I told people, uh, I told, told people at the press show for the five manual um so much of what we're doing in the ct5 uh, blackwing would have been science fiction when we started right if we could have done 668 horsepower and all of this stuff uh, back in 2004 we would have you know, we wanted to really make a difference we looked at everything from supercharged v6s to turbo v6s to we looked at everything we could the best solution for that car at the time was the ls6 and i think it was a great first step forward and, and like I said it really tested the brand took it into a place it really had never been before and um, and the rest is history but um, going forward you know electric cars that have a lot of good attributes that performance drivers already do love and, and will the more they get adopted into the market that there, there's a ton of goodness um, the big downside right now is the weight the good news is the weight comes with a really low center of gravity um, and that technology needs to mature a little bit over time. You know, charging, discharging, cooling, a lot of things are, are going to evolve over the next maybe 10 years that are going to so make it So before we get into electric or future of V, manual transmission. Mm. You were, I think it was only a manual, the first car. It was, yeah. And then there was manual automatic, and then for one generation of CTS V, there was no mm -hmm. manual. Manual. But then we finally did the CT5V Blackwing, and there is a manual. Mm -hmm. How is it you guys can do that, but I'll make it up, 
M5s and E63s can't. In a lot of cases, it's not that they can't. They just don't choose to, right? So if you go all the way back to the first gen, there wasn't an automatic transmission really in the world mm -hmm. that would have held up to that much power, to that duty cycle. There really was no solution. And so manual was the choice. And if you go back and look at all the cars of that vintage, most of them were manual only. Mm -hmm. um, by the time that we did the second gen, our six-speed was up to the challenge. Um, um, and that's part of what I talk about. This 10 speed is just incredible. It shifts so fast and it's, I mean, the gear splits are so small and it's got really deep first gear and a crazy, you know, overdrive. It's, it does everything you want perfectly. Um, shifts faster than most DCTs. Um, it's incredible. Um, but really that's, that wasn't available in the beginning. And so we've, we've, worked our way here and and now like you mentioned we didn't do a manual on the third gen by choice not not because we couldn't um we really laid down a bunch of us laid down on the tracks for this one and said look we have to do this the market is shifting away there's an opportunity where people still want that connection with driving um, especially I talk to more and more people now that we have super crews in production and it's such an awesome technology there are some people out there that just you know almost by principle, just don't want to be involved in that, and they want to go the other way. And you know what? That that's okay too. Um, there's room in this car world for for all types. And um, at first, we were getting like 65 to 70 percent manual uh, takers, which was incredible. I mean, you know, just to put it in perspective, we were in the 20 to 25 percent on uh, ATSV, and probably even a little less than that, depending on which body style of of the of the second gen CTSV you're looking at, you know, some of them were in the teens, mm -hmm. and um, even Corvette, when you go look um, to get over 60% uh, penetration, is insane. And so that whole first model year pretty much went over 60%. Where are we at now? We're still over 50, you know, in That's our in our total incredible. order bank. That's incredible. Like yeah. as a basis of comparison, 911s. 25 percent yeah right yeah best. and that's well you get into a gt3 they're 50 50 60 percent yeah that's a but that's the same kind of person you're trying to get to that's it yeah um was there significant pushback from corporate when you when you guys were like hey we need a manual and they were like no you're just a racer you don't know what you're the, talking about the pushback is and and anybody that's in the industry will sympathize right you you know we we put together the planning group engineering we kind of put together the how much is it going to cost us to do this how many do we think we can sell what do we think we can charge for it pretty basic stuff right and there's a fair amount of assumptions that go into that um especially when you're playing in this part of the market where there isn't a lot of data to suggest and so we put our business case together around fairly limited assumptions about you know look this thing has to make money at like i forget the exact number but it's in the 15 percent penetration range mm -hmm. And um, so when this thing starts penetrating at 60, 65, um, it almost flips the argument like, why did we do the automatic? <laughs> that costs a lot of money to do. <laughs> I mean, obviously not, but, but you get the point, right? If we would have known it was going to be 50%, then yeah, like zero pushback because it, it makes all the economics work out. So that was the leap of faith on this one. Are we really going to sell these things, right? Are you sure people want the bigger car? And that was why we didn't do it on the, the last gen. Um, there, was a, there was an assumption that, People would want the smaller, mm -hmm. uh, more nimble car. That's the one people are going to want to take the track. Oh, yeah, the bigger car, you know, that you wouldn't want that. But we heard loud and clear from people, no, yeah, they would. And, and we're hearing them vote with their pocketbook and say so they do. So could you use this new learning? Because this is unusual information for any manufacturer. Could you use this learning to either, A, extend the life of the car, or, B, get a, a subsequent car? <laughs> Um, look, Cadillac, th this is a bigger discussion uh, than, than to me, but Cadillac as a brand is shifting to electric. And so this is the last of its generation. So I don't want to mislead anybody. Don't, yeah. don't hold out for the next gen CT5 V Blackwing. We are not planning it. We've been clear about that during the press events and everything. Um, you know, I'm not happy about that, you know, but that's just the reality. We as a brand are shifting to stand for electric vehicles and 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 all of that and that's where we're going and i'm and i'm good with that and i think we need to get people to understand why we're doing that why that's relevant um so no yeah we're not we're not gonna say oh this one's selling this now so we're gonna do I another wanted. one i'm sorry i know but at least you're honest yeah that that's why we love each other yeah right okay so now moving forward mm -hmm. how does v and blackwing have a future 
an EV. Yeah, like I mentioned, there's a lot of attributes of electric vehicles that, that make fantastic performance vehicles. When you look at tractive effort available at any moment in time, never having to wait for a downshift, um, instant torque from zero speed, all the things that EVs t that are just part and parcel with, with an EV are fantastic attributes for a performance car. Um, the weight is the thing, right? And like I mentioned a minute ago, you know, luckily the weight comes low down in the car, so you get a low center of gravity. Um, cooling is the big challenge and really the the ability to recharge when you're in an environment where you know if you go to a track day and you want to use your car and you still got to get back home you know how do you how do you recharge the thing but i really do think a lot of that's going to come with time the more people that do this the more the infrastructure will catch up the more uh, cooling solutions and other technologies are coming a lot of it isn't there right now because evs up until this point um haven't been performance oriented so the the market and the suppliers and and us we haven't done a lot of the things that are needed to do um it'll come and that's all i can say we're working on it others are working on it the struggle that mm -hmm. i'm seeing is you're you guys are moving to ev so fast mm -hmm. and f what i've been seeing in terms of battery technology just getting lower weight battery technology the, this there's the idea of solid state there's some other like there's a, a startup here that's working, I think, with BMW here in Michigan. A startup that's working on lower lower weight battery. I don't see that coming to production anytime soon. So you've got a a bit of a gap. It's like crossing the chasm. It, ha, how yeah. do you cross the chasm? There, there is a little bit of a gap. Wonderful, like bare-chested bruisers that the CT5 <laughs> Emanuel is, to the point where you do have a low weight battery. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of this that's future product stuff. We're not going to talk about exactly when. Mm. You're looking at the industry exactly right. The stuff that, that is commercially available today doesn't lend itself to making a worthy successor to a CT5 yeah. Blackwing. Th there's just no doubt. Um, and that's the challenge. And that's mm. the challenge that the team, yeah, there's a huge number of people here at GM that are actively sitting down thinking about what does a performance V um, and V Blackwing look like. There's two levels now to our product offering and so you'll see a V and then eventually when when the technology is really ready you'll see a black wing and that, that's a little bit off in the future I'm not gonna lie that's not next year right that's not even the year after it's okay that's, that's an there. honest answer yeah. that's a very honest answer appreciate that uh, do you see a way to retain like you look at an like an E63 mm -hmm. you look at an M5 CS which is a magnificent car mm -hmm. they are more refined than a CT5e Blackwing. But notice, it's not a bad thing. The CT5e Blackwing, it's it's perfectly imperfect. <laughs> I love it. it. Well, Is there a way to engineer imperfection into a very perfect powertrain? Yeah, well, uh, you're, you're bringing up an interesting point. A lot of the imperfections you mentioned are sort of side effects of getting the performance out of an ice engine or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that the quirks that people are going to get to know and love in, the in performance electric cars are going to be different. And um, we are, <laughs> you're, you're really hitting on all the right points here. I mean, what does that visceral connection to a car mean mm. when you're not, you know, worried about tuning the exhaust and induction like we have been for a hundred years? <laughs> and um, everybody's struggling with that to some degree and people are, you know, pe pe you, you, I'm sure you're aware of some of the interesting things people are doing. And it's all about getting that connection, that, that connection you want, certain people want as a driver. Some don't at all. They want to just be insulated and drive, and, and we're going to offer that. Um, but others want more to be more involved with the process, and they're willing to put up with some of these quirks. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, just stay tuned. It's going to be an interesting ride. So in terms of some of the quirks, uh, are, you, are you thinking about doing something like a two-speed transmission? I'd say thinking about it. I mean, we've seen, you know, Porsche is the one that I know of out there that's doing that. and Works very well. We Well, yeah, and, and I've driven them. And, and when you look at why would you do that, it brings complexity and weight. Is it the right solution? I can say yes. We're studying things like that. Um, that that's all. I mean, that's a fair yes, we are. We, we've looked at that. We've looked at why you would do that, why you wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, we've looked at all sorts of things torque vectoring individual motors for each wheel how many is the right solution weight complexity where do you share all those components that's going to be the game in the future the, the idea of you know um 
sharing components becomes interesting when, when you look at how specialized really performance EV needs to be. It's going to be interesting to get the economies of scale on that stuff. Well, you know the drill now. This is the point of the episode where we turn this around this to the audience to get some feedback. This is a big subject, so what feedback do you want about the future of V? I, I should have thought more about this one. This is a good opportunity. Um, yeah, I'd say just feedback on, uh, and one of the topics we talk about all the time is what and how is someone going to want to use their performance EV? You know, uh, we you know we put down the specs first and engineer everything up into that. And how often are you going to do it? How far do you drive from from wherever you're you're at to a racetrack and back? How 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 many hours it, during a day would you want to use it? I mean, all those kinds of things. Like what? Or are we crazy and people aren't going to want to use their EVs for autocrosses and track days? I mean, I don't know. know. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear people just tell us what what do you, what do you think you're going to do with your performance EV, or what that, do you do? I think that's a damn good today? question. Would you use it for track days and, yeah. and, and how often? I, I don't think I would. But then again, I'm a broken car guy. <laughs> so let us know in the comments below yeah. or via our social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I want to share a little bit about a factoid about you that most people do not know. Oh um, GM, they classify drivers. They do. They do. And what, what's the classification? So we put this in place years ago to make sure that people that are driving certain tests, A, can do them safely, and B, can exercise the car and get, you know, if you're going to run a, a vehicle tech spell, VTS level test, that you can exercise the car and truly get it out there. So we've got a system that goes one through six, uh, six being the highest, one being kind of the entry level you can drive on the test roads at the proving grounds kind of a thing. And, and um, yeah. And you are? I'm a level six. And yeah. how many level sixes Just are there in the, in the company? Pulling this out of me. I honestly don't know. Probably, I don't know, uh, 35, 40, probably. I don't know. Something out like that. Out of thousands of engineers. Out of a whole lot of engineers. I've been very fortunate to have the right jobs to justify why I needed that training <laughs> and certification. So, And that is why this is the man running performance cars at Cadillac. Until I see you in the next episode, do